You're still watching the AM show right here on Joy News. But as the results from the Electoral College in the United States of America elections are pouring in, Donald Trump is addressing the public at a rally at his campaign headquarters in Florida. Let's take you there right now to take a listen. We have to, we have to let them come back in, but they have to come in legally. They have to come in legally. Let me also express my tremendous appreciation for Susie Chris. Just a job you did. Susie, come, Susie, come here. Come here, Susie. Chris, come here, Chris. Susie likes to stay sort of in the back, let me tell you. The Ice Baby, we call her the Ice Baby. Come here, Susie. Chris, come here, Chris. Susie likes to stay in the background. She's not in the background. Come here, Susie. This was unexpected, but I just want to thank, obviously, President Trump for this journey. It was a great one, um, and he's a hell of a candidate. And he's going to be a hell of a great 47th president. And this team that we had, the best team, and, of course, even my boss, Susie Wild. I've never seen her be shot before. Susie, uh, they've been, they're great. Everybody up here is great. Everybody up is very, very special. But uh, the Trump, yeah, who did you say? Oh, let me tell you, we have a new star. A star is born, Elon. Now he is an amazing guy. We were sitting together tonight. And he spent two weeks in Philadelphia and different parts of Pennsylvania campaigning. You know, he sent the rocket up two weeks ago, two weeks ago and I saw that, and I saw rocket, that rocket, rocket coming, coming down, down, and down, down, and down, and down, and when it left, when it, left it was beautiful, it was beautiful shiny, shiny white, when it came when it down, and down, it didn't look so pretty, pretty. It, was pretty. it was going 10,000 miles an hour, it was burning like hell. I said, what happened to your paint job? He said, we said, we never made the paint that could withstand that kind of heat. And But I saw it come down, and down. Republican presidential nomination. Kamala Harris has now earned enough delegate votes to become the Democratic nominee. This is a brand new presidential race. As the U.S. goes to the polls to elect their next leader, who is winning, Kamala Harris or Donald Trump? He wants to put them in jail. I'll give them a seat at the table. Kamala Harris is a radical left Marxist rated even worse than crazy Bernie Sanders or Pocahontas. Your election headquarters, George. But, you know, I was president, and now it looks like I was going to be maybe president again, so I figured I could ask him to hold. So I asked him to hold. And because, especially because you're going to be president again, they hold. So I took the phone down, and I'm looking at the screen. I'm seeing this crazy thing that's going around and coming down. It looks like it's going to crash into the gantry. And I said, oh, no. And I said, do me a favor. Do you mind holding for a couple of minutes? I want to see this. I thought it was a space age movie or something. I put the phone down. Bad part, I didn't pick it up for 45 minutes, and he was holding. But this spaceship came down, and I saw those engines firing, and it looked like it was over. It was going to smash. And then I saw the fire pour out from the left side, and I put it straight. And it came down so gently, and then it wrapped those arms around it, and it held it. And just like you hold your baby at night, your little baby. And it was a beautiful thing to see. And I called Elon. I said, Elon, was that you? He said, yes, it was. I said, who else can do that? Can Russia do it? No. Can China do it? No. Can the United States do it other than you? No, nobody can do that. I said, that's why I love you, Elon. That's great. And you know, when we had the tragic hurricane, Helene, and it hit, in particular, it hit North Carolina, they were really devastated, the water. This was a big water, as big as we've ever seen, water hurricane. It built lakes out of nothing. Fields became lakes, and 
And the danger was unbelievable. And the people from North Carolina came to me and they said, would it be possible, at all possible, for you to speak to Elon Musk? We need Starlink. I said, what's Starlink? It's a form of communication. So I called Elon. And I'll tell you what, he had, and it was very dangerous. People would die. They had no communication. All the wires were down. I called Elon Musk. I said, Elon, you have something called Starlink. Is that right? Yes, I do. What the hell is it? He said, it's a communication system that's very good. I said, Elon, they need it really, really badly in North Carolina. Can you get it? He had that there so fast. It was incredible. So, and it was great. It saved a lot of lives. He saved a lot of lives. But he's a character, he's a special guy, he's a super genius. We have to protect our geniuses. We don't have that many of them. We have to protect our super geniuses. I want to thank some of the guys. You know, we have up here today the U.S. Open champion. He's a fantastic golfer, slightly longer than me. It's a ball, a little bit longer than me. Just a little bit. Bryson DeChambeau is up here someplace. What happened to Bryson? Where is he? Bryson. Oh, he was shot. He's hitting balls. Oh, he's on the way. He's hitting balls. Bryson. Oh, look at him. He had a great, he's a, got a great career going. Great U.S. Open, Bryson. That's a fantastic job. And we also have a man, Dana White, who has done some job. He's a tough guy. <laughs> so Dana started UFC and uh, came to me, do you mind if I use your, nobody wanted to give him Marines because they said it's a rough sport, a little rough. And uh, I helped him out a little bit, and I went, and I said, this is the roughest sport I've ever seen, but I began to like it, and he loved it, and nobody's done a better job in sports. And, and you know, he's a very uh, motivational kind of a guy, what he does. He gets these fighters, and they, they really go at it, and it's become one of the most successful sports enterprises anywhere at any time, it's doing so well. I'd like to ask Dana just to say a couple of words, because people love to hear from him. Dana, please. Nobody deserves this more than him, and nobody deserves this more than his family does. This is what happens when the machine comes after you. What you've seen over the last several years, this is what it looks like. Couldn't stop him. He keeps going forward. He doesn't quit. He's the most resilient, hard-working man I've ever met in my life. His family are incredible people. This is karma, ladies and gentlemen. He deserves this. They deserve it as a family. I, I, I want to thank some people real quick. I want to thank the Nelt boys, Aiden Ross, um, uh, uh, Theo Vaughn, Bustle with the boys, and last but not least, the mighty and powerful Joe Rogan. And thank you, America. Thank you. Have a good night. That is a piece of work. Now he's an amazing, he's really an amazing guy. But most of all, I want to thank the millions of hardworking Americans across the nation who have always been the heart and soul of this really great movement. We've been through so much together, and today you showed up in record numbers to deliver a victory. Like, really, I probably, like no other, this was something, this was something special. And we're gonna, we're gonna pay you back. We're gonna do the best job. We're gonna, we're gonna turn it around. It's gotta be turned around. It's gotta be turned around fast. And we're gonna turn it around. We're gonna do it in every way, with so many ways, but we're gonna do it in every way. This will forever be remembered as the day the American people regained control of their country. So I just want to say that on behalf of this great group of people, these are hardworking people. These are fantastic people. And we can add uh, a few names like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. He came in. And he's going to help make America healthy again.
And now he's a great guy, and he really means it. He wants to do some things, and we're going to let him go to it. I just said, but, Bobby, leave the oil to me. We have more liquid gold, oil and gas. We have more liquid gold than any country in the world, more than Saudi Arabia. We have more than Russia. Bobby, stay away from the liquid gold. Other than that, go have a good time, Bobby. We're going to be paying down debt. We're going to be reducing taxes. We have — we can do things that nobody else can do. Nobody else is going to be able to do it. China doesn't have what we have. Nobody has what we have. But we have the greatest people also. Maybe that's the most important thing. This campaign — this campaign has been so historic in so many ways. We've built the biggest, the broadest, the most unified coalition. They've never seen anything like it in all of American history. They've never seen any young and old, men and women, rural and urban. And we had them all helping us tonight, when you think. I mean, I was looking at it. I was watching it. They had some great analysis of the people that voted for us. Nobody's ever seen anything like that. It came from — they came from all quarters — union, non-union, African-American, Hispanic-American, Asian-American, Arab-American. Muslim American, we had everybody, and it was beautiful. It was a historic realignment, uniting citizens of all backgrounds around a common core of common sense. You know, we're the party of common sense. We want to have borders. We want to have security. We want to have things be good, safe. We want great education. We want a strong and powerful military, and ideally, we don't have to use it. You know, we had no wars. Four years, we had no wars, except we defeated ISIS. We defeated ISIS in record time, and, but we had no wars. They said, he will start a war. I'm not going to start a war. I'm going to stop wars. But this is also a massive victory for democracy and for freedom. Together, we're going to unlock America's glorious destiny, and we're going to achieve the most incredible future for our people. Yesterday, as I stood at my last stop on the campaign trail — I'll never be doing a rally again. Can you believe it? I think we've done 900 rallies, approximately, from the — can you imagine? 900 — 901, something — a lot of rallies. And it was sad. Everybody was sad. Many people — I said, this is our last rally. But now we're going on to something that's far more important, because the rallies were used for us to put — be put in this position where we can really help our country. That's what we're going to do. We're going to make our country better than it ever has been. And I said that many people have told me that God spared my life for a reason. And that reason was to save our country and to restore America to greatness. And now we are going to fulfill that mission together. We're going to fulfill that mission. The task before us will not be easy, but I will bring every ounce of energy, spirit, and fight that I have in my soul to the job that you've entrusted to me. This is a great job. There is no job like this. This is the most important job in the world. Just as I did in my first term, we had a great first term, a great, great first term. I will govern by a simple motto, promises made, promises kept. We're going to keep our promises. <laughs> Nothing will stop me from keeping my word to you, the people. We will make America safe, strong, prosperous, powerful, and free again. And I'm asking every citizen all across our land to join me in this noble and righteous endeavor. That's what it is. It's time to put the divisions of the past four years behind us. It's time to unite. And we're going to try. We're going to try. We have to try. And it's going to happen. Success will bring us together. I've seen that. I've seen that. I saw that in the first term, when we became more and more successful. People started coming together. Success is going to bring us together, and we are going to start by all putting America first. We have to put our country first for at least a period of time. We have to fix it, because together we can truly make America 
great again for all Americans. So I want to just tell you what a great honor this is. I want to thank you. I will not let you down. America's future will be bigger, better, bolder, richer, safer, and stronger than it has ever been before. God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Donald J. Trump, the man who will be the 47th president of the United States in West Palm Beach at the convention center there. He said he's going to make America great again for all Americans. Uh, said God spared his life for a reason in those two assassination attempts. He said promises made, promises kept, and he has a big agenda ahead. He thanked a lot of people on that stage and said success will bring us together. Uh, trying to bring the country together after what is a bruising, damaging, very vitriolic campaign that comes to an end with this massive win. He praised a lot of people, including Elon Musk, who he called a new star, uh, up-and-comer, that guy. He's, he's, Have you met him? Have you heard I, I think about he's him? an up-and-comer. Uh, he went on about the rocket for a while. He did. Um, but he did the dismount, and now he goes on to be president-elect. Of the United States, once it, again. It's an extraordinary story. An absolutely phenomenal political comeback for Donald J. Trump, who will be the 47th president of the United States uh, when he is inaugurated on January the 20th. And he said that God spared him from those assassination attempts in order to lead the country. He said success will bring us together. And he said it was an honor. And he thanked everyone involved and thanked the American people for tonight's outcome. We have no indication that Vice President Harris has made a phone call. Uh, we're trying to get confirmation that there has been any concession. We don't have any word that that has happened. We were told by her campaign that she's going to wait till tomorrow uh, to do something and to respond to all of this. Uh, but no phone call, as we can tell right now. We're going to wrap up with our panel, Harold Ford Jr., Katie, Katie Pavlich, Mark T. And that's it, the United States election, well, drawing to a close, if you may, the Electoral College deciding who becomes the next president, the 47th president of uh, the United States. And number 45 apparently is coming back. I'm talking about Donald John Trump. In case you didn't know, there's a John in his uh, name. And 267 of those needed, the magic number, 270 electoral votes, He's just a whisker away at this point. Statistically, he's practically uh, there. Like you just heard, there's been no concession from Kamala Harris, uh, the Democratic nominee or uh, representative. But we're here in the studio, and we're going to be having a discussion on uh, the fallout from this American election. Happy or not, America has decided, like I said earlier, they have chosen their chalice, and they'll have to drink down to the dregs. You make your choice, you make your bed, you lie on it. But joining me in the studio, Sweetie Abochi is in the wings. She's also here. We also have Nanaya Omreku. He's an analyst of international affairs. He follows these matters keenly uh, as far as the American system and its elections are concerned. I also have in the studio, he will be walking us through the slides, the different dynamics age categories and others. How did people vote? We'll be having all those conversations. Kofi Ajay is a data analyst. He joins the conversation as well. But we also have Dr. Arthur Kennedy. He is a political stalwart. Uh, we all know him, a medical doctor. And he also resides in the United States. So he has a lot to say about that system. I'll be finding out whether he voted and how he voted. And we also have, finally joining the conversation, from uh, the USA, Pennsylvania to be specific. And you know how crucial that state was as far as the Electoral College votes. Martin Pettigo uh, joins us from there. He's a Ghanaian American citizen. Gentlemen, Doc, uh, Martin. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Doc, can I, can I hear you? Yes, good morning. It's, it's really good uh, to have you. So hold for me, gentlemen. Let me come right here into the studio and start with Nanea Omreku. Did you see this coming? Well, good morning to you and uh, all your viewers. Mm. I think I had projected um, right here on Joy News yesterday that right. the indicators pointed to me that Trump was going to win this election. Mm. And if you look at the issues that were up for discussion, uh, Americans uh, decided and indeed decided to go in the direction 
of Trump. I think Trump came across as somebody that could, you know, um, savor the America's economy. And economy was one of the salient issues up for, for discussion. Immigration, you know, the Biden administration is said to have done a very bad job, especially when it had Kamala Harris, who was considered as a border czar. He was put at the front line in solving the immigration issue, and the Democrats never had anything to show. These are real issues that are biting American citizens. Economy, right. jobs, price of groceries, all these other things. Mm -hmm. And Trump is seen as the best man. And you see how his two times assassination attempt also went in his favor. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in U.S. elections, what you call the conservative, uh, how do you call it, Christians do matter. And Mostly the evangelicals. Evangelicals. Right? And mm -hmm. Trump's assassination attempt came around as a, he, he, he was seen as a mystified force, right? And, and the fact that he was able to avoid this assassination attempt meant there was something bigger, a bigger Larger problem. than life. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and he's, it, it's played to his gallery, and we see that he's repeated it in what appears to be a victory speech, even though I was expecting that he would you know, take his time. He would apply bricks on that. But we also know Donald Trump. You know, it's, it's a way of asserting, being assertive and making sure that he knows what is happening so you don't come around and you know, alter election results. So I think by and large, for me, I had predicted, and I had also predicted that it will probably be a slim margin, and we are seeing what is happening. If you look at North Carolina, it looks as if he did well, and it's the state he won in 2020, but it looks as if he's done better now than in 2020. That tells you that Americans are really deciding um, um, to go in, in his direction. Unfortunately, we have to wait and see what happens, but it looks as if by, by the permutations we have now, and right. following keenly from Associated Press, uh, uh, Trump is headed to, to the White House for now. Well, uh, that is the tale of the tape. But let me come back into the studio now and focus on uh, Kofi Ajay. Kofi Ajay, our data analyst. He's going to be walking us through different dynamics. Kofi, good morning. What do you have for us? Good morning, Ben. I mean, if you look at all the dynamics, the two main candidates, we're looking at this magic figure on the wall, mm. 270 just like Ghana, you need to get, you know, 50% plus one of popular vote. But in America, you need to get this magic number on the screen there of the Electoral College vote, which is 538. Now we know that Trump has actually crossed this, you know, uh, threshold and he's heading to the White House. But going into this year's election, these were some of the polls that we saw. This was Gallup's final poll in October before the election. It turns out this really did not work, but it actually sits within the margin of error that that poll came through. Now, away from that, we look at if elections were actually held on popularity, what is the status of both political parties? If you look at the Democrat from 1992 to 2020, if you look at the eight elections that have been held so far, they have won seven. Republicans just won. If you add this year's election, that brings Republicans' number to two versus uh, you know, seven. That means that Democrats, in terms of popularity, are there. Uh, you know, way and you're talking about the popular the, vote. The popular vote. Because and usually, the, the, I mean, you can count from George W. Bush mm. all the way you know, versus Al Gore all the way to yeah. now. Usually, the Democrats would get the popular vote, but the Electoral College system would... Uh, knock them off the pedestal. Absolutely. But this time, yeah. for the first time, you see Donald Trump getting the popular vote and also uh, getting the Electoral College as well. And in fact, that's what you have on the smart wall right now, where you're looking at the popular vote trends. This is the second time in you know, <laughs> the last nine elections that the Republicans are actually winning the popular vote. We understand that Donald Trump didn't just win the Electoral College vote, but he also won the popular vote by more than 51%. The last time this ever happened in their favor was George W. Bush, who won it with 62%. And you can see how Democrats have actually been, you know, uh, you know, dominating this space in terms of popular vote. But away from popular vote, let's talk about the most important aspect, right. which is the Electoral College. This is how it looks like. But this slide actually simplifies what we have on the screen for you. Just look at the elections from 1992 to 2020. And you could see that Donald Trump has been the best performing, uh, you know, presidential candidate for the Republicans in terms of the Electoral College. Even George Bush could not make it to above 300 of the 
538, you know, electoral college votes. Donald Trump did it in 2016. That was a time where all the polls were saying that he was not going to win. And we know the famous Professor Alan Lichman who said he was going to win. Mm -hmm. And after winning, he scribbled a note to him and said, thank you. This year, he actually predicted something different, saying that, uh, you know, Kamala Harris was going to win. It didn't turn out that way. I don't know the note that Donald Trump will send to Alan Lichman. But what we have on the screen right now tells you his dominance when it comes to the Republican Party in terms of electoral you know, vote. These are some of the key issues uh, that went into the elections, what was important to Americans. So we decided to track this from the last Gallup post. And what we see was that um, you know, the economy was number one. In terms of extremely important versus very important, if you add this to, we are talking about some 90%. That means that if you sample 10 out, uh, 10 of the American registered voters, nine out of them said economy was a top issue, followed by democracy, terrorism, and other issues such as the type of Supreme Court justices candidates will actually pick. That was very, very important. And the last one that we all expected, immigration. So in, ter in terms of the top five, immigration was actually the last one, but the figure there is still significant. If you add the two, we are talking about some 70%. The last one that has to do with if you really drill down to those who participated in this, uh, you know, uh, registered or this polling mm. and trying to see those who are actually Republicans, what you see is that for them, economy was a top issue, followed by immigration and there were some other issues. If you go to the side of the Republicans, it was totally different. For them, democracy was number one. Number two was a type of Supreme Court justices candidates will pick. Why? Because we all know that it was a Supreme Court that allowed Trump to actually contest this year's election. Abortion, which never, never actually featured in the top five of the Republicans, was number three in terms of the demo. Healthcare and education, very important to them. Now, this for me is the perfect graph to actually explain what really went into this year's election. And, and Kofi, I want us to do this. After you're done with mm. that, I just want to also let us quickly, very quickly, so that we can bring in our guests, mm. look at the, the age dynamics, the race dynamics, and other, other crucial matters very quickly, and then we'll get to our guests. But well, so let's ahead. look at this crucial matter, which is, this was the question, candidates will better, which candidates will better handle these key issues? So you have these seven issues there, and just like you see, on the issue of economy, the Americans said that they believe Trump had the probability to actually solve that situation. 54% said that, look, Trump can solve it. In terms of immigration, they said Trump can solve it. Right. Um, foreign affairs, Trump can solve it. Gun violence, they were actually tied there. The health, abortion, and cl uh, you know, climate change. So if you look at the issues, the ones that were very national in nature, Trump, was actually leading in terms of economy, immigration, and foreign affairs. Ben. Right. Uh, Kofi, hold, hold it there for me. I'll, I'll bring you back on because there were other you know, pertinent issues we have to look at. But let me also bring in uh, Dr. Arthur Kennedy and, of course, Martin Critico. I'll start with Martin. Pennsylvania, crucial state as far as this election uh, was concerned. Did you vote? Yes, I did vote. How yeah. did you vote? Yeah. How did you vote? Maga, Trump. You voted for Trump? Yes. For, for which reasons? What, what made you want to vote for Trump? On four reasons. Um, uh, first was uh, strength of the economy, um, order security, strength of our national security, um, controlling inflation, and then about fracking, based on these four. Fracking? That's fracking. interesting. Yes. W what what yeah. were your concerns with fracking? Well, I believe that uh, America has... Um, uh, one of the third largest uh, world uh, reserve in the world, and it's like we're still buying oil from Saudi Arabia. We can frack and then still um, reduce cost of living for our people here, American people. So, okay, so yeah. it was about the prices of fuel. That's right. I see. Uh, did you participate in early voting, or did you vote as yesterday? No, I'm a conservative, so I voted um, yesterday. Okay. Right. All right. Uh, ho hold for me, uh, Dr. Arthur Kennedy. Did, did you vote as well? I mean. I don't know what the dynamics are for you. No, no, I, didn't, I didn't vote. I haven't taken American citizenship. Okay. I've declined to take. All right. So, so uh, I'll, I'll come back to Martin briefly. You voted on these issues. Your side right. has won. 
But if you look at the dynamics, especially in Pennsylvania, where you are, what do you think accounted for Donald Trump sweeping, taking Pennsylvania? Because it was a crucial, one of those crucial places that either one had to win to get a head start or get ahead. What do you think? I think, I think he spoke the common man's language. You know, he went out to the voters and let him understand. Now look at your life. Look at how much you are, you are paying. Look at how much you are earning today and how much you are paying on supermarket on, um, and also on fuel, and then compare it to um, my time and then this present time. And it's just obvious. Um, no, you, the math is just clear. You know, look at your lifestyle today and then the previous four years, and then just do the math for yourself. And then he spoke the, the lay down man's language. He campaigned, he didn't change any strategy. The strategy he used this, this, this season was just like what he used four years ago, and that's it. And there's one thing about an entrepreneur. The way entrepreneur, entrepreneurs uh, move or they forecast or they project things is different from their um, political, uh, um, how do you call it, politicians who see things from a political perspective. So he came in as a businessman, tackled the whole thing as a project, and he won. Before I go back to Dr. Arthur Kennedy, uh, there's this area of interest for me. So. You, you voted on the back of these, but you do realize that in terms of GDP, the GDP is much better than under Trump currently for the United States. In terms of inflation and some other dynamics right. like unemployment and all that, while you may say that at the micro level you're buying groceries for more and all of that, the dynamics favor the Democrats. Are you aware of that? that that's for you, Martin. Come in again. Sorry. I was thinking you were talking to Mr. Atta Kennedy. Come in again with the question. Sorry. Right. So, I mean... Yeah. Trump supporters would often p point to the hardship and all of that. But I'm saying, if you look at the GDP, it's better now under the Democrats. If you look at inflation, if you look at unemployment, those figures right. don't point to times being better under Trump. Right. You, you do realize that. It is true. You know, if you have to depend on, if you have to talk about statistics, I mean, um, the status quo will always reign. But at the end of the day, just look at your pocket. How much are you spending now? Mm. So people are looking at, the everyday activity today how much am i spending that now how much am i paying on taxes how much how much am i paying on on a mortgage <laughs> how much am i paying for uh, uh for, for for gas we call it pet gas we call it petrol in ghana so it's, it's all about the statistics it's about how much money have i paid this year for just goods and services Right. Sweetie, I watch you will be coming in shortly. But Dr. Arthur Kennedy, what would be your reflections on uh, the performance of Donald John Trump versus Kamala Harris, how the, the chips have fallen? Yeah. Um, um, good morning to your viewers and to um, fellow panelists. I think history was going to be made either way. If Kamala had won, she would be the first woman to be president of the United States. But Trump made history too. He would only be the second president to return to the presidency after losing it. Mm -hmm. The to do with it was Grover Cleveland when he did it in 1884. Mm -hmm. um, so um, Mr. Trump has had a remarkable turnaround. And I think this might probably be the greatest political comeback in American. They used to say that about Nixon. But I think the keys to um, Trump's victory as um, Martin puts it are correct, but there are other factors. I think obviously talking about the economy, I think you were trying to make the case that the statistics about the American economy now is better than it was under Trump. But most Americans on the streets don't believe that. They think that grocery prices have gone up, mortgages have gone up, I pay a few of them myself. So um, but, but, that matters. But, but, but Dr. Arthur Kennedy, the, the statistics. Addition, the statistics are what they are. Is it? Is it? You can you can give it to them and say, okay, what I feel does not reflect the statistics. But the statistics are what they are. You can't change that. They are the reality. So it's either some people don't want to read, they, they or, or maybe they they won't trust the stats. Okay, so let me give you some history on that. In 1992, you remember Bill Clinton's strategy was the economy stupid. He won the election by campaigning on an economy that most Americans felt was bad. What most people don't know is that a few days after that election, figures for that quarter came in showing that while Clinton had won by top 
how good the GM British and other economies were relative to America. The American economy had actually been better than all of them. Unfortunately, those statistics. Hello, Doc. Okay, we seem to be losing uh, Dr. Arthur Kennedy uh, a bit there. We'll try to reconnect with him, get the feedback, and then uh, get what his thoughts are. He was making an interesting analogy there, taking us all the way back to uh, 1992, of course, uh, Bill Clinton taking us to the close of the century. But let me come into the studio, Sweetie Abochi. Uh, I don't know what your reactions are so far. I well, mean. first, I just want to start with my elements of surprise. You know, in the build-up to where we are right now, most of these um, posters and analysts said that it would be a tight race. And towards the end, that is when we'll see a shift. And um, in the sun after Kennedy's back, let's get um, a complete trail of thought before we get back on. Um, Hi, Doc. Uh, you were making a point. We lost you at some point. You would have to unmute, uh, Dr. Arthur Kennedy. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Loud and clear. Yeah. So, so um, another point is that um, it is true that Donald Trump's political career was almost over after what happened on January 6th. But I believe that his career was resurrected by a number of factors. I think the Democrats after him too hard, and a lot of people on the streets believed that they were targeting him unfairly. And some of the charges they brought against him were ludicrous. You know, things like um, pay somebody for sex. Um, the federal government even thought that no election of had been come. Well, Doc. Hello, Doc. Okay, well, let's, oh. let's, let's take it from there because, right. uh, I mean, Kofi Ajay is also standing in the wings, but... But Sweetie. I did want to just make this brief point that mm -hmm. um, at the heart of all the concerns of the people of America, and it's of course there's the democracy, there's cultural and political landscapes here and there, but I was looking forward to a, a, a tighter run, you know. I didn't think that Donald Trump would you know, give such a gap in terms of what we are seeing right now. Be also because... The electoral college also, system, I, know, I mean, the numbers I don't... Hold on, a, hold on a second. Also because aside the economy and the important things, there was so many controversies. We know that he has some felony charges right now. I'm talking about Donald Trump. Mm. And of course, Hillary, um, Kamala Harris had his own fair share about his origin and, you know, controversies around that. But what I'm concerned about right now is foreign policy. What does this mean? We know that Trump has taken yeah. a strong stance on China. We know that he's talking about his approach that we focus on bilateral agreements, NATO and defense question and all that. How do the people of Americans, and Martin, this is a question I want to ask, ask you. How does all this sit with you in terms of Trump's um, posturing, in terms of foreign policy, his comments or his position on China, NATO, and the Middle East and other regions? What do you make of it? And, and if I may add, if I may add, the fact that the last time he was president, you know, he withdrew the U.S. from some, mm -hmm. you know, U.N. Uh, participation and even funding. I don't know what your thinking yeah. is on that as you answer that question. So let's find out from you, Martin. What does all this mean to you in terms of foreign policy um, in America right now? A return of Trump. Demonstrated uh, when he was in power, uh, peace to strength. You know, uh, when, it, when Trump was president, we didn't have new wars. It was just old wars. ISIS was defeated. Um, China, there was tariff on China. Um, Mexico, there was tariffs on Mexico. I mean, the border issue, um, Mexico had to come in and then um, parade their troops by the borders of the United States. We went to a negotiation with, with tariffs of them. They said, if you don't stop the illegal entry, we're going to put tariffs on you. It, it happened. So it's, it, with Trump, it's all about common sense. He goes down there, he looks at the situation, he looks at the metrics, and then he said, look, this is the way we have to go. There must be a new comeback, a new resurrection, and that's what I see. Trump has demonstrated this before. Uh, is it four years ago, 2020? And I think, based on those records, the American people have spoken. Okay, I think Ophelia is also standing by to give us more um, details. Let's get right into that. Well, so we've been looking at the... Democrats and Republicans. In fact, we are talking about Harris and Trump, their policies on certain key issues. Let's first start with immigration. 
now that Trump is on his way to the White House, let's give him that focus, what he's been saying about immigration. He says he's going to do the biggest deportation operation ever in the U.S. history. He's talking about some 20 million people that are going to be deported if he's actually elected. He's been elected. Let's see if this will actually pan out. Let's look at the economy, what Trump has been saying about economy. He's been talking about tax cuts, imposing, uh, you know, sweeping tariffs on imports, which we've been talking about, and protecting Social Security and Medicare. On the issue of abortion, he says that abortion policies should be set by the states. So he feels that overturning Roe v. Wade should be maintained. I mean, if you look at an issue such as, uh, you know, if you look at the, the geopolitical issues or international affairs issues, these are the top issues that we will be looking at. One is the war in the Middle East, NATO alliance and climate changes, you know, aid for Ukraine and immigration. Let's look at what Trump has been saying on that currently. On the war in the Middle East, he says he's going to end it immediately. He's been elected. Let's see what he will do. And on the issue of NATO alliance, he says that he may consider leaving uh, the 75-year-old alliance. And he says that, look, we are not going to pour unnecessary money into fighting anybody's war. We probably will leave very soon. On the issue of climate change, he sees this to be a hoax. And he says that he's going to exit that landmark Paris climate issue. And we know that President Okufuado has been, you know, saying that the world leaders should, should actually you know, stick to their commitment by providing that $100 billion that they, they actually promised African leaders in fighting climate change. Trump doesn't see this to be a big issue for him. On the issue of China, for us, this is important because whatever happens between, you know, the U.S. and China actually has an impact on Ghana as a country. He says that what is it going to threaten the scale-up economic, you know, attacks on Beijing and enact you know, a 10 to 20 percent, you know, tariff on nearly all imports from China. Very, very important. And you also have to take a look at that. Aid to Ukraine. Aid to Ukraine. Americans were actually really looking at this. Look, if you go on the streets of New York and you are around, let's say, Broadway or St. Nicholas, and you always see the protests around Columbia University saying that, the war in the Middle East must end. That tells you that Americans are not really happy with what is happening in the Middle East. He says that if you give him the power, he is going to end it, and he gives a timeline by 20th of January. That is actually going to, uh, you know, end. On immigration, this is important. We've been talking about that, uh, uh, you know, the 20 million deportation that he's seeking to carry out. To Africans, these are the key issues that will be important to us. Why are we even discussing this? Because we have a stake in this. I mean, there's, there's something in it for us. Immigration for us is key. LGBTQ plus activities, very important for us. Trade, grants or aid, and climate funding, very, very key to us as Africans. Okay. And, and there, there, there are so many things that Trump has been saying, and I want to show this last slide. <coughs> on immigration. We, we, we can't talk about Agua, but let's look at immigration since that is also very, very important. Looking at uh, the deportation exercise carried out by all the presidents in the last eight you know, uh, uh, you know, administrations. So this is what you have on your screen. Obama was actually touted as the deporter in chief. We've been checking this from 1992 to 2024, seeing who actually deported more foreign nationals. This month, Clinton deported 12.3 million you know, foreign nationals. Bush, 10.3, followed by Obama, 5.3. He is one of our own. He deported 5.3 million people. Trump, 1.5 million people in four years. And there you go, Biden did 1.1 million people. So he said he's going to carry out the biggest one, which means that's going to exceed this 12 million we see on the screen, possibly 20 million people. And that, that, that is pretty interesting. So I guess, uh, in a way, people have voted for deportation as well. So we'll see how <laughs> that pans out. But let's come into the studio as well. So there are some interesting statistics from the BBC as far as exit polls are concerned. I just want you to share your thoughts with us on the permutations, age, race, and the rest. Figure this. We all knew that white males 
even more so evangelicals in the United States, would go heavy for Trump. But if you look at it, males voting for Kamala Harris, 43%. For Trump, 54%. That's a deficit of about 10 percentage points. Females, of course, the, the, the reverse is true. 54% voted for Kamala Harris, 44% for Trump. But then if you look at race, whites, that is, um, so those voting for Kamala Harris, 43%, 55% voted for Trump. Then blacks, 86% to be expected. But still, maybe, a, a, if you look at the categorization, right. less than uh, the Obama had enjoyed, and maybe still less than uh, Joe Biden had enjoyed. A paltry 12% for Trump. When you come to the Hispanic community, why is this important? Because some of them had come into the fray and moved away from uh, different dynamics and said that they would actually vote Trump. And it's important that we actually get into these dynamics. Right. Uh, those Hispanics or Latinos, 53%. Uh, those voting for Trump, 45%. Asians, 55%. Trump, 39%. And others, 41% for Harris. So if you look at the blacks, the Hispanics, the Asians, it appears some of the numbers dropped in there. And that may have affected Kamala Harris. What's your take? Um, yeah, I think um, that's a, a lot of information to process at this particular mm -hmm. moment. I wish there was a projection for me to mm -hmm. really speak to it. But it also tells you that Harris has not been able to pull her weight in terms of securing votes for the Democrat Party yeah. as compared to Biden. Even. It's, yeah. and, and it's a very clear cut, especially when you are looking at states like Nevada. Mm -hmm. You know, um, in the last 12 elections, whoever has had to win, had to win 10 times in, I mean, Nevada had been very decisive. And if you look at the terrain, uh, 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 Harris is unable to pull her side of the bargain yeah. in securing votes for the Democratic, you know, um, party to, you know, to win this election. And it, it also tells you- think you, it was because she came late to the party? Look, to me, time has to do everything, time has to do with everything in this election. Mm. And to me, Harris did not have that enough time to be able to establish a solid base. To get the momentum. Yes. Trump had always been there, for court cases and everything. Idiot. And let me tell you something. I can give you a historical analysis of how Americans tend to punish first time president right. who decide not to go and put up their vice president. In 1952, it happened. Mm. President Harry Truman mm. decided not to go and put up his vice presidential nominee. What, did, what happened to the election? They lost, and that is how we saw Eisenhower come into power. 1968, a very similar scenario like what happened today. Mm. That was President Lyndon B. Johnson yeah. decided not to go for the election and wanted Hubert Humphrey to come and replace the Democrat Party. What happened? They lost miserably, and then Nixon came into power. So the terrain had been there. If you're somebody well, that is a student of international politics, yeah. you should know that Professor Lynchman was going to be laughing at the wrong side of his mouth this time around. Uh, and, and, the and projections, truly, eh? And truly, truly. Because he's always, he's, he's practically always been spot on. Exactly. But this time, exactly. he's been exposed. Yes. I mean, unfortunately, he's a very, I, I really like his analysis because he has a scientific calculation that he yeah. follows through. Yeah. And he, this time he predicted that eight out of the 10 goes in favor of Harris. So obviously, right. we're expecting a win for Harris. But this is election, anything happens. So the demographic constitution of US election changed this time around. And unfortunately, it, 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 uh, it, it went in the favor of Trump and to the disadvantage of, of Harris. Mm -hmm. So I think these are some of the nuances. And for me, I was expecting women to come out in their numbers to vote for Kamala Harris. Because, you see, she is representing reproductive rights. Right. And Americans, women, American women like to accept that, accept, accept that right. right. But the men are also interested in somebody who wants to protect women's rights even when they don't want need it. Mm. And Trump stood up as somebody that is willing to do that, protecting reproductive rights even when you don't want it. So all this play, and once again, I was expecting some change in the Latino vote, especially with the way things happen in the New York you know, yeah. Uh, rally. Yeah. But unfortunately, it looks as if Trump still has a very solid uh, uh, Latino vote when it comes to um, um, voting. So uh, these are some of the, again, I was probably expecting to see a new swing state. You know, maybe some other state that will politically realign yeah. and tell a different story. But it looks like um, it's still going to be the status quo going forward. But these are very interesting dynamics that we need to revisit. So, so if you look at it, the reverse happened. So the, the women's vote, as much as Kamala got 54%, uh, it was counteracted by the male vote of 54%. So That's it. it equaled That's out it. if you look at, if you look at the numbers. And, and I'm happy that if you are looking at the issues that are really crisp in U.S., abortion rights, is, it, it, I mean, it comes down. Because at the end of the day, it's a it's bread and butter issue. People are looking at the, their, their condition, you know, to vote. Mm. 
And so when people were talking about abortion, yeah, it was true. Roe v. Wade had been changed. It's set a lot of controversy in the country. But people are looking at things that affect, you know, their, their survival, you know, um, their survivability, um, immigration, economy. So these are important things that I think, you know, we can, we can yeah, drop. Right. And you're right. I mean, there was a lot of enthusiasm around abortion, immigration, and all that. But I do want to find out from um, both um, Dr. Kennedy and um, uh, Martin. Martin. Yes. So, so the mainstream media appears to be playing a significant role in this election. What are experts saying about the overall media influence in terms of um, voter decision? Let me start with you, Martin. Well, I think um, I would like to add something to what my big brother just said. I defer. Uh, Anyway, um, you know, Harris, right from the beginning, wasn't the favorite um, okay. before uh, she assumed the position to be the, the runner of the dip diplomatic, sorry, the, above the party. Her rating was really low when Biden was in office. Uh, I wouldn't use the word nobody likes there. I mean, she wasn't really performing. She was giving the borders that she didn't do anything about it. It's to the extent that she didn't really prepare for this office until Biden was pushed, who deterred and pushed off. So for did, her did to you come say she didn't did, prepare did, for it. She didn't really prepare for this position. What are you inferring because, that from? Because she well, was in the meeting. Well, because well, mm. yes, because tax, when she became vice president, she was giving a lot of roles she couldn't perform. For example, she was the border czar. The border was still open. She came out and said the border is secure. It's still not secured. Every role that was given to her, she didn't need to champion it until when they had the last debate between uh, Donald Trump. And then um, mm. Biden, when he had to be kicked out, she had to be forced into it quickly, speed up, and then prepare. Now, the media had to come in quickly to project her within three months. So, mm. look, the American people know what's happening on the ground. The media did a very good job by projecting her and pushing her until, until she became the delightsome. You know, Ma Martin, so, Martin, the media, yeah. especially Fox News, had also projected Trump. I mean, you can't say the media and there, there were there are right wing, left wing media. Trump has always been in the business. He has been an ex president. You understand what I'm saying? And he's still running. He didn't even go for the congressional. He didn't even go for the congressional debate. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So what I'm saying is that check the stats. Harris wasn't the favorite mm. until Biden was off the ticket. She had only three months to prepare. She couldn't prepare. She couldn't take hard questions. She couldn't come to the hostile media. All her questions were cooked. You know? So, so this is the problem. I, I mean, this, I is, really this, this, is, this is a pretty... Um, you, 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 yeah. you, say, you say she was coup d'etat, first of all, which I found pretty interesting. And now you're saying all her questions were cooked. What's, what's the basis and for she that? she was on Fox. Well, you should watch all her interviews. Very soft. The, she wasn't did, really you, did you watch the debate? I did which debate? Which one are you talking about? The first Very one. The first debate. Oh, yes, I did watch the debate. That was one, one of a lot that I could say that she really came out. You know, but look at all her subsequent debates, look, subsequent um, interviews with all CNN, NBNC, and ABC, um, 60. It was just soft questions. Mm. You know, she came to Fox. She was supposed to be in Fox. It's only 6 p.m. She got at 15 to, had only 20 minutes. Just for soundbite. I mean, just look, just roll down all the pages, roll down all the tapes. Mm. You know, so she didn't really prepare for this. But okay. the media had to come in, and I just want to thank God. To, I, I I thank um, TikTok, Facebook. I mean, now we are going through a new phase of media work right now. But Martin, you said she was yes. clearly not the favorite. Is it absolutely inconsequential that Trump is a um, a convicted felon. I mean, we have all those 34 counts of felon indictment, both in business and his political office. Is it inconsequential? I know that the, the, the laws in the U.S. doesn't prevent a um, convicted felon from running in office, but is it Perhaps those were cooked as well. Well, yeah. How, how consequential was that, was that? You see, um, should I say that the Justice Department, the Justice Department was weaponized? Seriously. On Trump, you know, and um, he had to face all these charges, things that happened so many years ago, maybe about 10 years ago, was all broke. Why? Because they wanted to prevent him from running for president. So it was weaponized against him. But it rather made him more popular because the American people can see what's happening. 
They saw what has happened. They, they, they could tell that this is Justice Department being <laughs> opponent against this man. So, so, you so the more are, are you they concerned, hate him, the more they what happened at the Capitol building. How many again? The Capitol and incident. That was a disaster. That was a disaster. That, that, should, that should be something that we should talk about. It's a disgrace. <laughs> but again, it tells you that American people are not interested in Jesus. They are more interested in how they can go to a grocery store, how they can buy gas. That's what American people are more interested in. Let us not forget, we have the political life and then the everyday life. The politicians who always like to talk about Jesus, who like to talk about taking Trump to, to court, etc. Et but American people are the final voice. What we are experiencing now is a great resurrection, a great comeback, and a golden age for America. Well, thank you for those comments. There's an interesting comment that has come through. Um, I'll not mention the person's name because I don't have the person's permission. But he says this, and I'm directing that to you, uh, Dr. Arthur Kennedy. He says, one thing everyone seems to be running away from is the fact that America is not ready for a woman president. They managed to deal with the black factor through Obama, but they are certainly not ready for a woman and a black at that. Well, she has a heritage in Indian Haitian and all of that. But Doc, do you think that is actually the scenario? It had nothing to do with how much she knew what she stood for. It was just the fact that maybe for some, she was a woman. Yeah, um, I'll come to that. But um, if you give me a moment to respond to some of the things that have been said. Uh, these presidents as incumbents have always not done well in elections here. It's not new. In actual fact, Martin Van Buren was the first incumbent vice president mm -hmm. elected directly to the presidency in 1986. When he did that, we had to wait till 1988, which is mm -hmm. one and a half centuries before George Herbert Walker Bush did it in 1988. It is not something that happens that often. Yeah. Having said that, the idea that Kamala wasn't prepared is a little. I think he oh, was saying it was a little far-fetched, but we'll try to Run work on the. Prince of, um, before she became president. So, Dr. Arthur Kennedy, um, we missed what you said. You say it was a little what far-fetched? Unfair to her uh, because okay. she ran for president herself. You know, so, um, and she was vice president. So I think that out of respect for her, we should um, respect her. Having said that, I don't think her problem was that she didn't have enough time. In actual fact, after the Democratic Convention, she was ahead in the polls. And that lead solidified after her debate. It's just that after her debate, like Martin Point, she avoided interviews, her performance in interviews. But as for the question of whether America is ready for a woman president or not, I think they when the candidate is ready and the candidate meets the moment. Obama was an exceptional candidate. People look at race. When we find an exceptional <coughs> candidate who is a woman, she will win. Um, I think um, Hillary, for example, appeared more substantive than Kamala. And I think that if she had done a few things differently in her campaign, she probably will have made it. I think um, Kamala, this hand. It appears we are losing uh, Dr. Arthur Kennedy much, again. The, president of the economy, it was difficult for, it was difficult for her to distance herself from positions she had taken earlier. They were very, that were very controversial. So I think those were the things that got it for Trump. And I agree with Martin. Americans are very proud. It's not that they don't care about justice, but they can see injustice from a mile away. So they felt Trump was being treated unfairly. And I always knew that this focus on January 6th will amount to nothing. Whoever wanted to understand it had to go back and read about the trial of Aaron Poe in 1804. He was the vice to Thomas Jefferson and he shot Alexander Hamilton. Mm -hmm. He was actually tried for organizing an insurrection against the United States and acquitted. Americans are very fair. And I want to add that if a third world banana republic never have been on the ballot because he would have been taken out. This is where institutions work and the public is very fair-minded and they are very conscious of the fact that 
power ultimately resides with the people and not with bureaucrats. Interesting, interesting comments, uh, Dr. Arthur Kennedy. I'll, I'll come back to you, Nanaya Omriko, in the studio uh, briefly. So just on two quick dynamics, age and education, you would realize that younger people voted more for Harris, middle-aged people voted uh, for Trump. So 18 to 29-year-olds, 55% of them uh, voted for Harris. 30 to 44-year-olds, 51% of them. It is the 45 to 64-year-old bracket where she falls to 45%. And as for 65 years and over, it's 50 for her, 49% for uh, Trump. But here's the other interesting thing. When it comes to education, those with a college degree, college graduates, 57%, you would say, educated voted for Harris, 40% voted for Trump. Those with no college degree, 43% voted for her, 55% for Trump. What do you make of that? So if, what I pick from what you just said is most educated people voted for Harris, right? and then the other group voted for Trump. Uh, Trump. And then the youth rally behind Harris, mm. and then the old age rally behind. Middle, middle aged, because even with the 64 plus, 65 and above, it was 50 for her, 49% for Trump. Okay, that's an interesting perspective. But then again, it tells you some of the issues that have been raised during the elections. Look, I had always said that, but for Harris, the election was for Trump to give. Mm. It was his election. Right. Either way. It was his it, to lose. If it was his to lose, sorry. Right. If Biden was coming up for me, it was still a cool job for uh, Trump. Do you feel Biden would have performed worse than Harris? Worse. Okay. And I, there's a reason why I say, once again, I can give you a historical analysis where frail and feeble presidents have been voted out after their first term. It happened to Jimmy Carter, right? There are other presidents I can go ahead to, to give you. But that's, that being said, let me tell you this. The energy or the momentum that we saw during the Harris' campaign was because Harris was able to energize the core Democrat voters who were not happy with Biden because they thought he wouldn't be a good fit for president in the second term, primarily because of his age. Right. So once he was taken away from the scene and Harris was introduced, then Trump was started looking as the old man in this election. And what it means is that it gave some boost to the Harris campaign. So age was important to me. He was able to energize the core voters. So it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me when I'm seeing this trend in terms of age-wise, the Gen Zs particularly rallying behind you know, Harris. The old ones are conservative in orientation, and they are interested in very core issues of macho manism, strong manism, somebody to front America's global, I mean, somebody's uh, America's internal strength. Mm -hmm. And they thought Trump would do a very good job at it. So this, this is one of the dynamics that I'll bring to perspective. Again, education. I do not want to believe that, you know, uh, on, because they were uneducated or haven't had a certain level, a certain class. I, of I don't think of that is what it's saying, but exactly. it's merely painting exactly. the fact that Ex more educated people voted Harris from the exit polls, and some less educated ones. But these opted for these uneducated Trump. group, mm. right, are also coming from certain rural traditional areas that mm. are very influential or very key in driving America's economy. Mm. And they are interested in... The Alabama and exactly. other places. Exactly. And that is why probably J.D. Vance was probably brought into the picture yeah. as somebody from Ohio who represents somebody who had nothing to something. And so don't, don't, uh, uh, looking at this uh, 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 statistics shouldn't be seen as explorables like what Hillary Clinton said to, uh, <laughs> referring to Trump voters as a basket of deplorables, <laughs> to which uh, 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 President Biden also referred to them as garbage. Yeah. That is not yeah. who voted for Trump, but key people that are interested in moving America's economy because of their contribution and how we see them. These are the people that voted for Trump, not necessarily because they are uneducated and because they were not able to read the policies and insight of Harris, therefore voted for Trump, if you okay. understand what I'm saying. I okay. think it feeds into what Martin said about Trump speaking the common man's language. language. You know, so what he was saying resonated more with the people who were focused on a better economy and all that. But Doc Atta Kennedy, you have some responses for us. Yes, I do. In actual fact, um, one of the things, two points, Trump has remade the Republican Party. He has made it a part of working people and the masses. It used to be a party of boardrooms and the establishment. He has reconnected that party to blue collar workers. And that is a realignment that we are going to see go forward for a long time. Second, his strategy runs as 
was masterful. Mr. Vance was eloquent, very yeah. focused. He delivered the points very well during the debate, and he has a life story that resonated a lot of people. You know, the children um, from a single mother who was a drug addict, who went to Ohio State, went to Yale, served in the military, made a lot of money. So his life story was attractive. But the big thing going forward is that Trump has significantly remade the Republican Party and connected to the masses. Our point is that the people with alcohol degrees are more than the people with play degrees. Mm -hmm. Hello, Doc. Yeah, okay. I said okay. my last, can you hear me now? Yes. My last point was that the people with our college degrees are more than the people with college degrees. <laughs> there are only one in three Americans. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's a valid point. That's two against one. F from my end, two quick things. The first you don't have to respond to. We've already seen on social media, you know how the permutations have been. Apart from the last election, we did not go that way. Uh, some would replicate or say that, oh, what happens in the United States will happen in Ghana's elections. I, for someone who deals with empirical evidence, for me, that means nothing. But people have already started, ah, a one-term president is back, so it may imply something else. Unless you're using some polls or something, uh, it, it, it may not be the case. But from where you sit, gentlemen, your final words, how do you think Trump in the White House will impact Ghana, Africa, trade, migration or immigration, and everything in between. Quick thoughts. I'll start with you, Martin. Um, I'll say that he's going to be a very um, uh, powerful president because he has his legacy at state, and he, I know he's going to do something about his legacy. And then he would like to prove to the whole world or to, to the American people that he's not, he's not a Hitler and that he's not a danger to uh, democracy. And I know he's going to prove to us all that he is a great president in the United States of America. Your choice of Hitler, though. Uh, Dr. Arthur Kennedy. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I actually um, Trump talks a good game, but he doesn't deliver much. Um, I think that the border will be tighter. Um, the influx, as we've seen, it will stop. But the deportations, there won't be anywhere much deportations as people fear. You know, his people have started talking about deporting criminals, focusing on people who commit crimes. 20 million people will be very hard to deport. So I think there will be deportations, but we're not going to see as much as a lot of people think. I think that he will be very strong on the place on a pivoka in support of Netanyahu. I think Trump feels that the Russia-Ukraine war has gone on for too long. Too many people have died. And I think that leaning on this relationship with Putin and um, Marzinski in Ukraine, I think that if he could, he would try to make a deal. And I think that the outlines of a deal are there very clear to give Russia an honorable way to, in effect, go back home without looking embarrassed mm -hmm. so that the dying can stop. I think those are actually very reasonable goals. I think Trump will not pull US from NATO he will support it, but he thinks that other NATO members should um, step up and they need to do. So that is what I expect. And by the way, the last comment on the media, I think the media was um, irresponsibly um, Harris's corner. They have done studies that show that about 85% of coverage of Kamala Harris was positive. I saw and that. And about 80% of <laughs> coverage was negative. Yeah. So the media was unapologetically in her corner mm -hmm. and that was unfortunate i am grateful that there was social media and other things and mm -hmm. the people looked at all the political spinning and in the end made up their own minds it shows that america has resilience that the rest of the world must learn from and i think trump will be a decent president in the second day. okay so you think he, he he has learned his lessons at the same point to you as as I conclude my end of uh, the conversation. And also he mentioned Israel. You know, Trump said that within a short period, I've forgotten whether he said two weeks, 50 days, 100 days or something, but he said he would end this Russian, uh, Russia-Ukraine war. You followed that. Any quick reactions from my well, end? That's um, I'm particularly concerned about what happens to Africa, you know, um, because Trump's, Trump's engagement with Africa was very minimal during his presidency. 
So I'm looking for it. When you say engagement, what do you mean? Trade, what? Uh, so foreign, foreign policy in terms of, okay. you know, America has a tradition. So there are some traditional policies. There's AGOA, there's FREPA, right? These ones are untouched. Yeah. And these ones, these two policies that I mentioned, they are up for negotiations. Mm. AGOA is up for negotiations. Yeah. FREPA is up for negotiations. Yeah. So what happens to these engagements with Trump's presidency? I'm looking for it, what is going to happen in, um, in, in, in Gaza, in Israel. We should be mindful that there's a lot of things that happened during Trump's time. I mean, as far as Israel and Gaza is concerned, yeah. it was during Trump's time that um, Tel Aviv was changed from the cap um, as the capital yeah. to Jerusalem. Yeah. In fact, Trump supervised the transfer of the Golan High sovereignty to Israel during yeah. his presidency. Yeah. It was also during his presidency it that also it, sparked a lot of trouble. Exactly, move move the, the U.S. embassy from Tel Aviv to uh, uh, Jerusalem. Absolutely. So there's a lot of people that are really watching to, to what will happen to foreign policy. And I, I think I agree with Doug when he says that there is going to be an end to the Ukraine debacle, but on terms, in my opinion, in my opinion, I think it will be on terms favorable to Russia. Uh, yes, Vladimir Putin. And that will be the, the honorable way, you know, for him to save his face and then bring an amicable solution. So, there's going, to me, there's going to be international politics and foreign policy of the U.S. Is going, to have, is going to be a roller coaster in the few days ahead of us. And I think international politics is as interesting as it's going to be with the 45th president back as the 47th uh, president. Yeah. Mm. Siti Abachi? Yeah, I mean, that's it for me. No more questions. But I think countries with strong diaspora populations in the U.S. might... Um, face some increased challenges if Trump reintroduces stringent immigration policies. But let's see how it goes. And I'm also looking forward to see how the conversations around reproductive health, especially abortion, um, how it progresses in the United States of America. But that's that for me. Well, this has been our conversation on the backdrop of the American elections. President number 47, Donald John Trump. I did say that if I were voting in the United States, I would have voted for Kamala Harris. But Donald John Trump, you have to give him his flowers. He is the man of the moment. He is president-elect, if you look at the Electoral College uh, votes. Thank you, our guests, for joining the conversation we had in the studio. Nanaya Mreku, he's an al analyst as far as international affairs are concerned. He's an expert when it comes to American uh, politics. We also had joining the conversation Martin Petigo uh, from Pennsylvania in the United States. He's a Ghanaian-American citizen, and he voted for Trump, uh, proudly so. And then there is Dr. Arthur Kennedy, a medical doctor, a man who follows the politics in the United States. He lives there as well. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining the conversation. We are grateful. Thank you. And that's how we cap it off. Uh, we'll be back with more action because, yeah, we're coming home to Ghana. How about our own politics? What are you expecting ahead of December 7? More action after the break.